All right. So you may be wondering, do we ever come across situations out here in the wilderness that are actually life-threatening? And the answer is yes. If you do this enough, you realize that it doesn't take much to go from having a great day to having a really bad day. You can have this happen from stupidity, bad luck, combination of both. And we've certainly had all of the above. So today, I'm going to narrow down the three times that we were in probably the most danger of severe bodily harm or worse. So number one is when I tried to climb Weaver's Needle. If you don't know what Weaver's Needle is, it's a very prominent feature in the Superstition Wilderness. I believe it's the core of an old volcano. It's this very imposing, tall, steep spire of rock right in the middle of this valley. I am not a rock climber. I have one rock climbing experience in a indoor gym probably 25 years ago in St. Louis, Missouri. So no rock climbing experience. At the time this happened, we had just gotten back from a canyoneering course. Now Tina had said, hey, we ought to try canyoneering. I said, sure, that sounds great. We went five day course, first time we've ever done it. While we were there, the instructor said, hey, you know, Weaver's Needle is really cool. You ought to climb that. There's a campsite at the top. It's really awesome. You get these great views of the superstitions and it's not too hard. So do a little bit of research, read a beta. This guy also says, oh yeah, you know, it's a little bit of using your hands, but it's not technical climbing, no problem to it. So that's mistake number one. When you read beta or you hear someone say, yeah, this is no problem. You have to put it in the context of their experience level and your experience level. In this case, both of these people had done a lot of rock climbing. I hadn't done any. I'm sure they had no problems. That was not the case for me. Valuable lesson learned. Anyway, didn't know that at the time. Uh, mistakes two and three, I decided to do it solo and I decided to do it in May. Now the superstitions in Arizona are extremely hot, fully exposed, no water. May's not a good time to do it. Solo is not a good way to do it. Hey, I'd had a canyoneering course, did a lot of research and prep on the trail. I was going to be fine. Grabbed my backpack, stake number four, packed it with overnight gear, a 200 foot rope, climbing harness, helmet, because there were two rappels. That should have been a clue to me that maybe it was tough to get up if you had to rappel down it. Uh, food for the night, camera gear, and a ton of water because there's no water out there. And I headed off. Now to get to Weaver's Needle, it's a brutal hike up the Peralta Trail. You get to the saddle, then you can see Weaver's Needle, then you go back down into the valley, then you have to climb up Weaver's Needle, and Weaver's Needle sucks climbing it. It is just this steep, loose scree. It was probably 100 degrees, full sun, but anyway, I get out of all the scree, I get up onto solid rock, climb up that for a ways. I get to the base of what's the bottom of the second rappel. So I'm maybe 150, 200 feet from the top. I had one piece of video from that trip. This was what I was thinking at this point. All right. So we've come from all the way down there. Now we're here and we have to go all the way up there. That's the Chuckstown. And then up there. Seriously? Yeah, so it was getting a lot more real. I was not going to let that stop me, so I continue on. Um, taking this heavy pack, I start going up this chute. And I get further and further, and I get maybe, I don't know, two-thirds of the way up, 60 feet or so, and this pack's just not working. I mean, I'm using my hands, and, and the rock's really slick, and the pack just wants to pull me backwards. So 
I can't go any further with a pack on. I don't know what I was thinking. I take the pack off. I guess I was going to push it up the, um, up the chute or drag it behind me. And so I start doing that for a while. And I get up just below the first rappel station. And I can't go any further. I don't see any footholds, no handholds. I just can't get up any further. Now, at this point, I'm probably around 80 feet up, and the gravity of the situation is becoming pretty apparent. It's a long drop down. If I fall, I'm going to die. It's, I'm, I'm going to be at least horribly mangled. So, just as I'm thinking this, trying to figure out what I'm going to do, out of the corner of my right eye, I see my pack go like this. It's starting to fall down the mountain. So I instinctively flip around, and now I'm sitting here, one hand on the pack, one hand on the rock, just stuck there. I can't take my hand off the pack. It's gonna fall down the, down the chute. If I move, I'm gonna fall. I can't climb with one hand and two feet. There's nothing to hold on to. I'm in trouble. Luckily, at this point, I made a good decision in this circumstance, and that was to not panic. I looked around and I evaluated my situation. I was able to pick out a couple of handholds and footholds that I hadn't seen before and make up a couple of moves in my head to take the pack and grab it from this side and move it over to a cliff that was a little more secure on my right and then get over there myself. I managed to do that without dying. So I'm standing here on this cliff. My feet are like this because I can't leave them this way because they hang off the edge of the cliff. It's that narrow. And I'm looking at the pack and I'm looking at the chute and I'm just like, how am I gonna get out of here? I, I don't, I can't get this pack up. Still not giving up because I'm an idiot. So I decide I'm gonna take the rope, lower the pack and all the gear I don't need. I'm gonna take the harness, the climbing gear, my phone, go up to the top, take a couple of pictures, come back down and camp in the valley. So I lower the pack down with the rope, pull the rope back up, and look at the gear that I still have. And I think, do I need all of this? I had a couple of things. I'm like, I don't absolutely need this. Got this bag, throw it. The second I let go of it with my hand, I'm like, that had the quick links in it that I needed or might need. Now I know I didn't need them, but at the time I thought I did. And at that moment, I did probably the smartest thing I did this entire trip. If I said, that's it, that is one too many mistakes, that's the straw that broke the camel's back, hook up the rappel, go to the bottom, you're done. And I called it, like 120 feet from the top. Now, I didn't want to do that. I wanted to keep going, I was right there. But I've said this before, and I strongly believe, don't stick with a bad decision just because you took a lot of time making it. And that was absolutely the case in this trip. Just because I'd been lucky and I hadn't died from all the other dumb things that I did to get to that instant, why keep pushing my luck? Hook up the rappel, rappel down to my backpack, I'm pulling the rope, and the tail of the rope comes down and I instinctively just watch it go down like this. And this rock, it's probably about this big around, baseball, hits me directly on the top of the head. What happened is the tail of the rope, when it was at the very top, had struck this loose rock and it comes flying down 80 feet, smacks me on the top of the head. I had my helmet on and it hurt. It was jarring. It was quite a surprise. But if I hadn't had that helmet on, I don't know that I would have lived through that. I mean, that's that's a projectile that big, 80 feet. That's got to hurt. So anyway, that's my story. I don't know how I didn't fall down that chute. So much stupidity there. But um, no hard feelings with Weaver's Needle. Uh, maybe I'll get back there someday. I don't know. So, number two. Um, this was Tina and I. We were backpacking Workman's Creek. And we're going down the middle of the creek. 
we we didn't have a lot of experience backpacking at this point i i'm sure that there was a trail on one bank or the other and we just were we just didn't know that and when it went into the creek we followed the creek really rough going really slow we come up to these boulders and here's a picture from the top looking down it's probably 20 25 feet to the creek down below i'm standing on the top of these things trying to figure out how we're going to get down and i hear tina scream i look over and she falls between two of these huge huge boulders now I'm thinking she's gonna, you know, this, this is not good. It's a little crack, so you could get your arm caught, your leg caught, twist it backwards, break a bone, bounce back and forth between the two rocks, hit your head, and the adrenaline hits me, and I'm just like, I every instinct is get over there and get down there as quick as you can to make sure she's all right. Luckily, I had the presence of mind to say, Go slow, be careful, because one of you's got to be okay to take care of the other one. So, took my time, got down to the bottom, and as I come around the side of these rocks, she's coming out of this crack, soaking wet, head to toe, and just laughing. Now, what had happened is, even though the crack that she fell down was on the bank, and there was no water at the bottom, the creek was over to the side, there was a hole that was probably... I don't know, only a couple feet around and just about as exactly as deep as she was tall. And she fell directly into that hole filled with water. I mean, she bounced off the edges and she was bruised up and everything, but she lucked out somehow. And here's this Tina sized hole of water <laughs> directly under the spot she falls in. So talking about it later, what had happened is when you have the creeks rise, they bring all this debris down. As the creeks go back down, they deposit this debris. I'm sure you've seen it. And on top of these rocks and stuff, it can deposit debris that looks like it's solid ground. And it's really a huge hole between the rocks. You step on it, you go through. That's exactly what happened to her. Learned that lesson and we always double check when we're walking on flood debris to make sure that it's sturdy because probably half the time it's not. So that brings us to the last near miss, and that was in Bear Canyon. So Bear Canyon is a beginner technical canyon. For very straightforward, a lot of people, that's their first technical canyon. At the beginning of the canyon, it's, it's fairly open, and you have these obstacles you get over, and there's spots where you get into the water, but then it slots up, and it becomes this really beautiful section of narrows. And one of the first major obstacles is this pothole. A pothole is formed, if you don't know, it's water comes through a canyon it kind of gets into a spot and swirls around and it digs out this sort of bowl shaped um, hole and a lot of those have water in it well this one did it has the chute going down water and then it has a lip that you have to get out the other side to go down canyon i'd been in the water earlier and it didn't strike me that that water is exposed to the sun because the canyon's more open, whereas this stuff is in the narrows and it never saw sun. I had a wetsuit, but I didn't put it on. I slide down the chute, splash in the water. I like to call this clip instant regret. Oh. 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 Yeah. Oh. 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 Yes. Ah, yes, you do. GoPro, stop recording. It's freezing. It's taking my breath away. I can barely talk. I'm not touching the bottom. I have no idea how deep it is. I go over to the other side to get to the lip to get out. I can't get out. It's just slick. I'm just like putting my hands up and just sliding down back in the water. It's become a bad situation really fast. I think it was panic and adrenaline. Just, uh, you know, it's, uh, it, I somehow got out. I get up on this lip, I'm freezing, I'm shivering. Mm -hmm. Tina is mm -hmm. on the other side of the pothole. Since I didn't stop to talk to her and formulate a plan to get through this obstacle, 
she didn't have her wetsuit on she wasn't ready so i've got to wait for her to put her wetsuit on i'm sitting there in this dark place soaking wet shivering uncontrollably i've got the pothole on one side i have to wait to help her out of that and on the other side is a rappel I, at least i was smart enough to while she was putting on her wetsuit i hooked up the rope for the rappel and i'm clipped in there waiting for her it, it seemed like forever but it you know it's a couple of minutes tops i don't know if you've ever been early stages of hypothermia I had not. I thought you got really cold, and then if you got cold enough and bad enough, you died. A couple of steps I'm missing in there. Hypothermia sets in, you lose all your dexterity, all your fine motor skills, your fingers. You're very slow, like all your movements are slow, but not just that, your brain, like your thoughts are very just, it was kind of incoherent. I was not thinking clearly, just not right, and I wasn't functioning right, and that's not a good thing. Thing to have happen when you're in the middle of a technical canyon. She comes up, get her through, do the rappel. I drop my rappelling device because my hands aren't working and I can't find it. Luckily that was the last rappel. Finally get to a spot where we've got some sunlight and I don't know what this is, 10 minutes later and I'm in a bad way. I, I remember wanting to argue with her and fight with her about putting on my wetsuit and uh, yeah, if it wasn't for her helping me through that, i, I might have had some trouble um at the very least if the canyon was much longer and she hadn't have been there i i would have been in a lot of trouble I, I got back to camp that night i just wrapped every blanket sleeping bag coat shirt i was just layered up and i could not get warm and like sat there and looked at the fire for about 30 minutes and then i said i'm going to bed and, and just passed out for the night hypothermia is no joke you come up to an obstacle you're supposed to evaluate it and just talk about it with your partner and formulate a plan to get through it. Don't just go jump right in. Those are three times that we got in, it got, almost got ourselves into a lot of trouble. Hopefully you found them interesting. It, even better, hopefully you learned something from them so you don't repeat those mistakes that I made. And uh, yeah, gonna keep trying to improve and stop having the stupid mistakes happen anyway. Thanks for watching. One more thing. I think the actual worst one was with Tina before we even met. Check this out. Good evening. A lucky night for two Mesa teenagers. They spent 36 hours stranded in the snow and nobody was looking for them. Explain how they were finally found. Well, a truly incredible story, uh, Patty. The teenagers were caught by surprise when the storm hit hard with heavy snow. That was about four weeks. But the amazing thing is how they were found by searchers that were looking for someone else. This winter wonderland almost became an icy grave. When searchers were combing the rugged, snow-covered Four Peaks area, they didn't know that the two major teenagers had been stranded since Sunday. We're trying to get out, and then we are just barely making it through, and then the truck stalled, and we couldn't get started again. And it was like, I mean, it was just a total storm. We had a couple of dry blankets. We had, like, a whole bunch of blankets that two were dry. And, and we had, the thing that saved us the most was, like, the propane stove we had. And we'd keep lighting up whenever we get really cool. And it was snowing. It was really, it was scary. Sheriff's deputies had spent most of the day looking for the owner of this truck, which was found half buried in the snow. No one had reported the teenagers missing yet. When they were spotted late in the day by a McDonnell Douglas helicopter, it was quite by accident. I was so scared because <laughs> I didn't think we'd ever get out of there. I knew that we would eventually, but it was <laughs> scary. My searchers have been cold, but otherwise all right. Well, certainly a good job by McDonnell Douglas uh, Aircraft Company and uh, the two teenagers. I'm a father of a 16-year-old, and I'll tell you what, uh, those two teenagers did it right. They had their gear, they were ready, and that's why they survived. And I guess, Jerry, it is important to stress once again, if you find yourself in that situation, stick by your vehicle. It's so important. Stay with, stay with the car, and we'll get you. All right. Thank you, Jerry. Tiene cara de guerrera como a todos en caera, pero conmigo ya está bien sumisa. No es mala mía, si anda sudando. Tú pasas todo el día conmigo aquí gozando y tra, tra, tra.